Welcome to the first public program in conjunction with Nirmala Dutt Statements. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning is uh, quite a commitment. Uh, so good to see so many people here. Um, what we're going to be doing this morning is basically taking you around the exhibition, stopping at various sections, and introducing one or two works uh, in each section. And um, before, it's going to last about 45 minutes, and just to keep things moving along, because there is a lot of work, uh, we'll keep the questions right to the end of the tour. And just to let you all know that we are recording this tour, and it will later be up on YouTube. So, but before I, we start, I'd just like to introduce everyone. First of all, my name is Rahel. Uh, I'm gallery director at Ilham and also one of the curators of the show. And my other three curators, Beverly, Beverly Yong, Ellen Lee, and Snow Ng. So maybe I'll kick off the tour by maybe telling you a little as to why we wanted to do this exhibition. Um, why Nirmala Dutt, um, and why now? <clears throat> so, well, Nirmala Dutt, first of all, was one of our pioneering um, artists uh, in Malaysian art history. She was uh, born in Penang and she moved to Kuala Lumpur and started exhibiting her works quite regularly from 1964 onwards um, at the Nation National Art Gallery. She also was um, among very few women artists of her time who continued to make work and had a practice which extended for over 40 years. And Nirmala, I think, really stands out also because of her work, which responded to social issues very early on from the 1970s. So she made work responding to issues such as the environment, uh, urban poverty, uh, war, and violence. And you can see that sort of throughout her practice. And also an artist who continually experimented with techniques, with mediums, um, from painting very early and then moving on to uh, documentary photography, silk screen, uh, right up to male art and public art. And I think when we walk through the tour, um, you will really get a sense of the breadth of her practice. So this is actually her first a uh, major survey uh, show held at an institutional gallery. And, um, you know, I, I, I just working on this show and having conversations with my fellow curators, uh, Beverly and Snow both worked and knew Nim. Um, it's been a very um, important learning experience for me as well, just knowing about someone who I think is just a remarkable artist. So. I'd like to now hand it over to Bev, who's going to be um, telling you a little bit more about how we kind of uh, arrange the exhibition. Thank, thanks, Rahel. Um, and we're you know, really, really honored to be part of the team putting together this show. Um, one of the comments from, from, from um, other artists and people we know was, it's about time <laughs> we had a show of Namala Dutt, um, who was formerly better known as Namala Dutt Shanmugalingam. Um, uh, using her, her, her married name through most of her career. Um, so it, although it's a review exhibition of Namala, um, it's not a, a thorough retrospective. Um, and we decided to, when we were thinking about how to, to frame the exhibition and lay it out, um, we decided not to sort of focus on the artist and her life and, uh, and the chronology. Um, but rather, she was an artist who, who made um, very clear bodies of work. So in each, as we go through the gallery, you'll see that um, we followed basically specific series of work, and each series of work um, really addresses specific subject matter and responds to certain, um, certain uh, phenomena or, or problems and issues that she, she was thinking about. So we, we, thinking about the title, um, we used Statements, um, which is the name of her first really groundbreaking work, Kanyata An. Um, which, which Hel will take us to, we'll start with soon, um, where she talked about environmental degradation, she talked about um, 
urban squalor, and, and she talked about um, the need for society to, to perk up and look at what's going on around, around us. So, without, so what we've done in the show is looked in parallel at two, two sort of um, two ways of looking. One was inward into Malaysia, so to, towards the right. Um, she, she made a series of works about Malaysia, about, about the immediate issues around us. Um, and sort of more towards the left, it's looking at the world, um, the world theater, war, and, and um, similar issues there. So she was always um, had, her, had her, her focus on things that, that triggered um, triggered a response, a social a response to social issues. So, but, so we're going to begin um, with her self-portrait, um, which I think is, is, is sort of sums up and what, she's, what she is trying to say to you in this show. And that's the only reason why we used statements. It's statements as a sort of uh, an artist statement, um, as well as a sort of witness statement um, to the world around her. Um, and I suppose the, this self-portrait, and these two self-portraits were made for a show in 1999 at Gallery Petronas of self-portraits. Um, and so she asks you the question, when are you all going to say enough and stop it? Um, so we start with this um, to, to begin the tenor of the show. Perhaps Rahel can take us to Kenyatta. So as Beverly said, uh, this was the groundbreaking work, uh, Kenyatta and One, or Statement One. And what happened was in 1973, the National Art Gallery um, held uh, an art competition uh, which was entitled Man and His World. And the idea behind that was to encourage artists to move from picture making to more ideas-based work. So Nirmala submitted this conceptual work but it was something she had already been working on. Um, and over a period of a couple of months, she had been going and documenting and photographing this area in Damansara, uh, a stream uh, that had been polluted. So you've got to remember that this is early 1970s, and Damansara was, you know, there was a lot of jungle still in that area. Damansara and Bangsa were being uh, developed into kind of housing areas that now you see. So the work has four elements in it. Um, one of the elements was an installation of rubbish and industrial waste from that area that she brought into the gallery. Um, so you can imagine 70s, this woman brings this whole pile of rubbish uh, in the National uh, Gallery and it caused, must have caused quite a stir. Uh, but the statement, or Kenyatan there, is like uh, basically a plea to people to say, we got to put pressure to stop the environmental damage that is happening. And she cites this stream that is being polluted. And maybe it's because I started you know, my working life as a lawyer, but it really feels like this is the court of law. Um, this is her witness statement. Uh, her affidavit, where she's saying, look guys, we need to do something before it's too late. And this is evidence, one, uh, which is the photographs that she's taken of the stream that has been polluted. Here are more uh, evidence, articles that she has either Xeroxed or she sort of typed out. Uh, you know, and it's like fog in London and Tokyo, um, Tasek Bera, which is, you know, very beautiful, but it may be in, uh, uh, impacted by logging. So these are all these sort of examples to say, we better do something before it's too late. Uh, and then of course, this installation of rubbish and industrial waste from the site itself. And it's, I think, pretty remarkable. One, because this was early 1970s, you're making work about uh, the environmental degradation, uh, this idea of indiscriminate development. This was a time when we didn't even have a Ministry of Environment. So really, I think, um, quite incredible in that way. And also, uh, the use of documentary photography. I mean, this was something that Nirmala took seriously. She had her, uh, her own dark room uh, in her, stu her studio. So, and the way the photographs are arranged, 
in a grid. So this was the first work in the series, but then she moves on to then document the people who live in this area. So specifically children who were living in these polluted areas, in these squatter settlements of Jalan Damansara. And if you look, it's Batu Empat of Jalan Damansara. And if you look at a Google map, uh, it's actually the location where the new pavilion is being built in Damansara Heights. Uh, so if you've been, you live there, or you've been around there, you know what a complete mess <laughs> it, it actually is. Um, so, you know, nothing really has changed, uh, sadly. I'll just point out this work, Kenyataan uh, 3, and this is uh, photographs that she's taken of the children from the same uh, squatter settlement, but one in 1975, and then the same children in 1979. And on the side, uh, as she says, bagi kanak-kana ini perubahan tidak banyak berbanding dengan pembangunan di Bukit Damansara Bangsa. So you see how, the, what development and how that area has changed so much. But for the lives of these squatter children, nothing has actually changed. Um, so just this sort of different periods of time that you see, it's, it's, um, it's like a photo essay that tells you this story. And they're more, um, I think you can come back uh, later and have a look at all the works in this section. But I think we can move on to Kampong Polo. That's a, um, with with Kenyatta and the Kenyatta and series, um, she, 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 she made documentary photographs um, and that, uh, she moved from painting to this documentary photography. But while her gaze was still on um, the issue of um, squatter settlements, uh, displaced people, people who, uh, who, who were kind of sort of left outside of the, the, the whole Bina Malaysia was a slogan that was going on at the time. Um, progress, development, especially urban development. Um, so she, she kept, her, her, her eye on that. Um, so from, from Bangsa, Damansara, um, we come to Kampong Polo, which is just literally a stone's throw from this gallery um, around the Royal Polo Club. Um, and at the time, there was quite a big um, news sort of coverage of uh, a, a, a squatter settlement where the community was being evicted. Um, they, were, they were trying to, to throw them out for development. Um, and so you see in her paintings here, um, the use of uh, newspaper media um, and silkscreen, um, as well as as well as um, uh, painterly brushstrokes. So this will become a sort of hall hallmark of of Nim's um, um, painting for for a good two decades. Um, so, and you'll see she uses sort of repeated images, um, almost like um, making you see again and again and again. Um, what she's pointing out, and she'll use text from, from, from the article, so you're, you're peering in and you're reading the stories behind, um, behind what, what, what's going on. Um, calling out things like no reprieve, um, things like um, talking about TBKL, hati <laughs> binatang, um, um, so even the use of kind of graffiti, uh, and, she's, and, and you'll see, that although there are, there, there are works about um, difficulty um, and, and people going through uh, hardship, they're very beautiful works. And that's a contradiction, I think, that, that we, we keep facing. But, but we, she draws us into the work. Um, and, she's, and she's clearly an incredible picture maker as well. Um, so um, in Bina, Malaysia, um, this, this sort of uh, whole area, um, we've kind of thought of it as, as the stories sort of countering the, that, that narrative of progress and development. Um, so from, from, the, from the urban um, story, also the displacement of indigenous communities. Um, and, this, and, and here she follows the story of the Penan um, through from the late, um, the late 80s um, to, to, to the Bakun um, in, the, in the late 90s. This body of work is called uh, Mambalak, Jangan seberangan. Um, so taking from Malay proverb, do, do not log carelessly, lest misfortune 
before you. So it's a warning. This is a warning statement. And here she's used uh, news images of, um, of from, from the news of, of the communities, again, and also using patterns from the Penan weave as well. So talking about culture, people, place, um, in both contexts. Um, she experimented with the um, Munkudu dye, which is a dye they use in Hua weaving. Um, and so you, and for this sort of bloodiness and this rust, and you'll see that color sort of coming in her work through, throughout her career as well. Um, later, and then in, in another series um, about the Ma Mary, um, she, she talks about this sort of commodi commodification of indigenous culture, this idea, because she used to work in the tourism ministry or the tourism department um, early on in her career. And so I think she, she was very aware of the, the sort of narratives and the, and the sort of spin um, on, 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 on indigenous culture and Malaysian-ness and, and nation building. Um, and, and here she's experimenting very interesting um, ideas of the, of the grid um, and Carrie Island and the story of um, the community whose, whose land keeps getting sort of stripped away by you know, or pop plantations, while their culture is at the same time being used as a marketing tool for Malaysia. A poster, they're the poster, poster community. Um, and this is in the late 90s, um, when she starts, again, moving into this very harsh, stark kind of approach, um, which sort of brings us to, I think, her, a, a really sort of tour de force um, uh, body of work, which Rahel will talk about. Um, um, great leap forward. So this is the Great Leap Forward uh, series. Um, so if everything we've kind of talked about from the 70s, uh, things that she explored, um, environment degradation, uh, unequal development, all of it comes and sort of culminates almost in the series. Um, and this was painted in 1998. Um, and it really responds to Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad's industrialization um, policies, where Malaysia sort of moved from a largely agricultural economy to an industrialized one. And also this, uh, this idea of Malaysia Inc. or Malaysia Incorporated, where you see public entities um, such as Malaysia Airlines being privatized and being put in uh, sort of the hands of a small sector of uh, entrepreneurs. So the series is called Great Leap Forward, uh, which is a reference to Mao Zedong's uh, own policy in China in the late 50s, where basically China uh, was transformed very quickly uh, from an agrarian, a largely agra agrarian society to an industrialized one, uh, which led to um, you know, complete disaster with uh, widespread starvation, many far farmers committing suicide. So it kind of obviously tells you what Nirmala thought of, uh, the kind of policies that were happening in Malaysia at the time. And also in 1998, Malaysia was also going through this great financial crisis. Uh, which, also, which led to, you know, uh, a lot of political and social upheaval. So, I mean, this is, I think, probably my favorite series uh, because it's just so beautifully constructed. Um, and you can see here, for example, mega projects like the Twin Towers, uh, KLCC, um, Petronas Twin Towers, and the Bakun Dam, uh, which caused... Um, you know, total uh, environmental damages caused indigenous communities in Sarawak uh, to have to be moved out of their land. And maybe I'll just point out this work. Um, and here she has using, she has screen printed this article uh, that came out uh, in 1997 in the New Straits Times uh, by a journalist called Rose Ismail, and it's called The Crass Class. And it basically talks about the Novo Riche, uh, this new 
um, all the new money that was coming into Kuala Lumpur and Malaysia in the 90s. Again, this growth of the 1%, these very, very rich people. Um, and there's also an interview uh, with Jomoke Sundram, who's a Malaysian uh, uh, economist, where he talks about um, how the NAP NEP um, is not being implemented the way it was meant to be, so that the poorer Bumis are not actually being helped, and instead, uh, this top 1% are the ones who are kind of uh, enjoying the bounty of the land. Uh, and, it's, and it's actually very amusing, because it talks about this buying all the designer goods and going to Kampong, London, and you know uh, the lifestyles of the rich and famous. And she uses this image uh, of the Rangda. And Nirmala, that is another thing about Nirmala, she was constantly learning and uh, wanting to know new things. So she went to study Wayang uh, in the 80s in Jakarta. Um, so this Rangda is used in Wayang Kulin, uh, and it's usually a symbol of evil. And she also includes these little mirrors. Um, so maybe when she wanted us, when we look at this work, to also think about possibly our role in it. Uh, I mean, maybe it, it's a kind of a tongue-in-cheek jibe at maybe the rich collectors who eventually end up with her work, maybe saying, are you part of the, prog the problem as well? Uh, and you can see the uh, M. Uh, and the use of the triangle, uh, I mean, there, there are many possibilities. One could be that, uh, as I said, she was interested in Wayang and she learned Wayang. And in the beginning of a Wayang Kulit performance, and at the end, a puppet which is called the Kayon or Gunungan, which is about the tree of life. And it marks the beginning and end of a performance. And on the Gunungan puppet, you see different stages. One uh, being uh, the natural life. Uh, animals and plant life. In the middle is man, and right on top is um, the gods. So this idea that we are all connected, and what damage we do to any of to the to animals and the environment will impact on us. And also a reminder that life here is very transient. At the end of the day, we have to answer to our maker. But the triangle also, uh, in economic terms, also means inflation. Um, and one of our interns, Naim, uh, I'll show it to you later, was Googling. And actually, this particular uh, triangle form actually resembles the Malaysia Bole uh, logo, the early logo. So, so I think we'll move on. And I think Ellen is going to talk us through. Uh, oh. OK, um, so here we enter the, so we were in the Malaysia section of the gallery. Um, the right side of the gallery was more the section dealing with Malaysian issues and now we've entered the left side of the gallery which deals with more global affairs. Um, so, uh, actually maybe we should. <laughs> So I never personally knew Nim, and she actually, I've never met her in person. Uh, also never saw her works in person until this exhibition. But one of the things, uh, so I was pulled onto this exhibition because I used to work with Snow Ng Advisory and Projects where we help um, Nim, Nim's family to archive all of her works on, to create a website archiving all of her works. So actually, I've only mostly seen her works through a screen. So one of the things that struck me the most about Nemala Dutt's works were that she was one of the few or maybe the only Malaysian artists I knew who made works that touched on um, political issues outside of Malaysia. 
So in this, in this section, um, against these two walls, you can see her, her works on various conflicts during her time, which was also during the Cold War time. Um, we, have, um, we have depictions of the Vietnam War, of apartheid in South Africa, of um, the Bosnian War, um, and also we have the Friends in Need, which was uh, which comments on American and British involvement in the Libyan conflict. So, what um, I find really um, interesting about these works actually is how they reflect the total tumult of the time that Nimaladat was living in, which was the time of the Cold War. And um, this was also the time of massive industrialization, massive modernization around the world, and also the, ti also the, also the falling apart of empire, um, Around the world, many colonies were being liberated from um, British or their former empires. And, but it was also the beginning of a new form of empire through the, through the spread of capitalism, uh, through the spread of communism, and then the proxy wars that were being fought between America and the Soviet empire um, for ideological control over um, different parts of the world. So it was actually a time of massive conflict. Um, it was a time when a lot of countries were in massive upheaval, a lot of former colonies losing their old, um, their old, I mean, uh, you know, like the center falling apart and um, a lot of ambiguities coming in to fill the gaps. and. Um, it was also the time of the explosion of mass communication media. So you see, I think the, I mean, for us now, most people, we don't really read the physical newspaper, but I think through, this, through these works, you can actually see the impact that such an explosion of mass communication um, had on Nimalada, not just Nimalada, but probably the rest of the world. So you see um, just news images of all kinds of horrors, like napalm victims, um, police beating uh, black people in South Africa. Um, you see child soldiers, you see um, starving children, just um, Vietnam mothers crying for their children. And um, against, and all of these are set against um, Nimala's harsh emotional brush strokes, which really just bring out the, the emotional drama and impact that, and overwhelming, um, just this overwhelming sense of confusion and um, destruction that was going on around the world and man's cruelty to each other. Um, so, uh, I'm not sure if you want to talk about the Friends in Need work. The... Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um. And, and then at the end of this, this part, of the, um, part of the show, um, it's a sort of mirror of Kenyatta An, the first, the first room, um, which was really about the homeless um, or squatter settlements in, in, in Malaysia. Um, in the 90s, uh, Nim went to um, London and she studied printmaking, um, and I think also art history at Goldsmiths. Um, and what she noticed most about her time there were the homeless in London. 
I mean, she was really deeply disturbed by, the hom by, by this phenomenon of homelessness and how people treated them on the street um, as ignored. Um, so, so here um, we have just a small sampling of, of the prints and the drawings she made um, as she in, in, in London. Um, so she would, I think, um, Snow had lots of um, conversations with Nim about about this this period of time, and she, I think, she would, she would meet 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 these people, but then she'd run home, and then she'd, you know, <laughs> quickly sketch out, um, and 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 she's sort of decided not not to sort of um, to almost portray them in a classical way, um, like. like like from a from a Renaissance frieze or or that kind of thing. So that's quite, um, and there's also um, a, a display of her sketchbooks from the time, which if you have time, do have a look. Um, but I think so. So the way that the two ends link up, it really talks about the human condition, um, and and the fact that she she focused yes on Malaysian issues, and she, and she looked out in the world and saw what horrors were going on. But what she was trying to say really was that this. Is all of us. Um, it's, it's, you know, um, there's a there's a quote um, about the um, uh, that the tears of a mother in, um, in Vietnam. Vietnam are the same as the tears of a mother in Trangganu. Um, so she talks about the human condition throughout throughout her consistently throughout throughout her decades of work. Um, and, and so we're going to sort of more or less come towards the close um, to to a body of work she made towards the end of her career. Um, Ellen will talk about. Okay, so here we are at Tsunami, this grey wall with the blue, um, blue and monochrome paintings. So we chose Tsunami and Great Leap Forward to be at the two central uh, walls of the gallery. They are the ones that, they are like basically the feature walls of this show. Um, I think they, even though they are, they are both very different actually from most of Nim's works and they are visually uh, impactful, even though all of Nim's works are visually impactful, but I think these in contrast with um, all the other works in the show, they have the greatest visual impact, which is why we put them at the two feature walls. So Tsunami, um, was made later in Nim's life after she had she had fallen quite sick and then lost lost a lot of mobility in her muscles, so she couldn't really do the silk screen painting uh, the silk screen works that she was making in her earlier years. Um, uh, this so um, I think we didn't really mention, but Nim actually started off. Um, started off her art practice learning, uh, doing abstract paintings, which you can see in the yellow corridor there. And then um, throughout, uh, over her practice, she moved towards more silkscreen printing using newspaper images because she felt that abstract painting did not really speak to what she wanted to express as an artist, which was her response to these kinds of um, destruction and um, d destruction and um, happening in the news that was really touching her quite deeply. But interestingly, towards the end of uh, towards the later end of her career, she returned to painting. Um, but uh, so this series touches on the. Indian Ocean Tsunami of 2004, which was also called the Boxing Day Tsunami because it happened on 26 December 2004, one day after Christmas. It started in the Indian Ocean and it just developed and grew and grew and it heavily impacted um, communities, coastal communities all across the Southeast Asian region. Um, all across the India and Pakistan region, and I think it uh, the effects were felt as far as Africa. Um, this tsunami is actually listed as one of the most destructive tsunamis um, in human history. So Nimala um, 
prior to this point had taken a break from art making and also from watching the news because the news really impacted her very, very deeply. But when she saw um, her helper watching news of the tsunami, she was just riveted to the TV and she could not stop. So um, apparently for like a week straight, she just consumed news about the tsunami and about the destruction it wrought all around the world, but also about the heights of human compassion that came out in response to the tsunami because people's homes were being destroyed, um, people's livelihoods destroyed, a lot of people were missing or found dead, um, but also the, the levels of um, the levels of human empathy and response to the crisis were very deeply moving to her. So um, this is only a small selection of the total body of tsunami paintings, which actually numbered, I think, 50, and they, uh, over 50 or more. And they were made in uh, some smaller sizes as well, but in keeping to this same square format with a placid blue sky and just big gestural waves crashing in the foreground. So uh, big whites for the foam and um, ashy black to sort of have that contrast and to uh, give this sense of the total levels of destruction um, that was wrought by this tsunami. Uh, so when it was first displayed at Valentine Willie Fine Art in 2005 or 2006, um, it was just this one whole line of tsunami and uh, kind of using her similar technique again of repeating images like boom, 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 boom to really give you that sense of um, to give you how th that sense of how deeply she felt the impact of such catastrophes in the world. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Thanks, Evan. Um, and so that that sort of looks at um, the, the the different phenomena and um, the aspects of the human condition um, she covered. But I think then that there's, there's two more sections of the exhibition, which you can just very quickly um, turn to, um, which really revolve um, firstly around women. Um, Namala never liked to be talked about as a feminist artist or a feminist. Um, it was just, um, her, her interest was human, um, just the human condition. But of course, women are often the victims. And as a woman, she felt a natural empathy um, for them. So um, in this series called um, Women One, uh, we've got Women One uh, and Four and Five, I think. Um, we, she kind of, I feel like she, she sort of um, counters this idea of, of the female body. She looks at the body and she looks at the female form and how it's been used in art historically in the Western canon. Um, and she turns it around on it. Um, so we, we, we see sort of neutral or, or this sort of silhouette figure. Um, and, what, and what I feel is in using sort of imagery of, of perhaps birth, um, of also the experience of domestic violence. Um, these were two works made for the uh, an, uh, WAO. Um, um, and much later in life, she also, um, when she couldn't really paint or make uh, that sort of work anymore, she, she did, um, she experimented with with works, uh, uh, sort of installation and, 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 and um, text and documentation about, um, about, about domestic violence, uh, sexual abuse of children, and, um, and, 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 and that's sort of just documented here, just to warn um, that that's the content um, of the iPad here. Um, and as well as um, one of her last works was called City. Um, where she uses pictures um, taken from Kenyataan, the, 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 the children in the squatter settlements. And it's really, and she mailed this out to friends. And there are just seven pictures of, 
of laughing faces of girls. Um, and it's about human innocence, um, I think, and about, in a sense, perhaps a hope, which is a nice note, I think, to end on. Um, and perhaps it takes some time just to, 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 to look at this section, which we call beginnings and ends. Um, so we have some early works by Namala and some very, uh, and um, a paint, two paintings from the very end of her life, um, when she picked up the brush, I think one last time, really, um, and she was painting um, flowers, these huge flowers, uh, white on white. Um, and there's also documentation of um, Namala's catalogs, writing, and, and press, press reviews here. Um, I think that's um, perhaps the end of the tour. And Rahel, do you want to close up? Does anyone have uh, any questions? Oh, we, well, we're going to be around for a little while, so you know, please feel free to uh, come up and ask us anything you like. Uh, and please spend time just looking through uh, this exhibition. Um, well, maybe we have one minute. Shall we just talk about side the, that exhibition? Sure, sure, go ahead. Yeah. Um, no, just to because I think it's quite an interesting. Uh, little story. Um, this, uh, this work, uh, Friend in Need, was actually part uh, of an exhibition in 1986 called Side by Side, which was a Malaysian-British uh, exhibition. Um, and on the day of the opening, uh, the work was actually taken down um, at National Art Gallery by an official from the Malaysian-British Association. Because obviously this was... Uh, you know, one of those country to country kind of uh, friendship type exhibition. And this work where Margaret Thatcher is bare breasted, um, she's like a Wayang Kulit uh, figure, uh, Raksaksa type figure, um, you know, um, was not exactly the most diplomatic work, shall we say. So it was taken down. But what was, I think, quite remarkable was the response um, by the arts community. Um, and there's actually a lot of media articles around that uh, incident, two of which are here. Um, and, you know, artists and poets, Usman Awang, many uh, artists kind of responded and said, this is ridiculous. And what I find really... Um, really quite special about this incident was the director of National Art Gallery, Said Ahmad Jamal. He came out and uh, insisted that the work be put back, and he wrote a letter uh, which was made public, which apologized to Nirmala and said something to the words that art is meant to provoke, art is meant to, for us to question ourselves and the, and the world, and Nirmala, you have done something um, really important. You know, we need artists like this. And I just thought, yeah, this is, this is what it means to um, be the head of a national gallery. This is the kind of uh, courage and that kind of stepping forward. So, yeah, that's the story behind that work. And thank you all for coming, uh, and please... <laughs>